Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Craig Brown to talk about the history of tree viewing. Thanks, Brian. Uh, now, I think Brian might have uh, misled the bunyip. Um, he, uh, I think, said in the bunyip or in press release that uh, I established the nursing home at Treasure, and uh, that in fact isn't correct. That was done by Bill Blinman. Um, sorry, Brian. But, uh, I first became aware of Treasure when it came up for auction on the, on the published in the bunyip on the 21st of March 1976 when I was 25. Um, the auction was conducted by. Right. Yep, there we go. Um, the auction was conducted by Ray Gerlach, uh, assisted by Peter Nilbeck, who I understand still lives at uh, James Martin Village. And the vendor was the public trustee on behalf of Bill Blinman's estate. The partnership with my then wife, Pam, uh, a nurse, her parents, Lang and Geraldine Williams, were the only bidders, and after lengthy negotiations, the property was purchased for 85000 And that was probably a bit more than... Uh, two times the uh, average house price in Gawler at the time. Um, it was a difficult purchase for us, um, as difficult as it was for the public trustee. 100% finance was provided by the public trustee and the working capital overdraft guarantee was provided by my parents. The partnership had virtually no cash and the transaction settled in May 76. The business was in initially conducted by Pam Lang and Geraldine. I was a silent partner. I continued working at Michelle's in uh, what was then called Personnel and Industrial Relations. It's now called People and Culture, I think. Things change. Um, the partnership made pretty slow progress and by 1980 was struggling with meeting upgrading progress required by the regulatory authorities. I moved into the business in November 80 and the partnership split up in, in 1982 uh, or three, I'm not too sure which. Uh, with Lang and Geraldine retiring and uh, bought out. Now, Sparky P Proprietary Limited uh, was the company that we uh, used and uh, acted for uh, Pam's and my family trust, and that continued the operation until our separation in the late 80s when uh, Treasury became uh, my particular problem. But Sparky remained uh, until uh, November 2011 when it was transacted to the Wheel and Care Group. Um, from around 2008, it became clear to me that for Trevi to survive, it had to be part of a larger group. There had been a fair amount of consolidation in the industry, and it was clear that that was going to go on and accelerate pretty substantially, and it would have been virtually impossible to transact a, a single facility. Trevi at that stage was uh, 45 beds, and uh, that was generally regarded as uh, an uneconomic site size at the time. The CEO of Rest Haven, uh, uh, who I knew quite well, did comment to me not long before uh, I, I sold the business that I was probably the last nursing home owner who actually knew the residents and was amongst the last thing, single facility operators in South Australia. That's, that's what Treasury looked like um, when, uh, when I'd finished. Um, when there were, I'll just flick through those slides. Um, this building here was the building we built in the middle uh, uh, in the middle 90s, and the one you can see back here was uh, built uh, in uh, about 2003. Uh, when there were opportunities to buy another facility in earlier times, uh, James Martin, when Peter Peter, Peter Hatcher and Bruce Fletcher, Bruce Fletcher purchased it, uh, we didn't have the resources. Uh, to buy it or do the required work at Treasury and James Martin. And similarly, the other facility that uh, interested us was Kadena Homestead, and uh, we didn't have the resources to do that either. So my resolve was to make Treasury the best mouse trap we could, and that was incredibly well supported by Treasury's key personnel and staff over many years. The Whelan family, uh, who I knew very well and had worked closely with uh, in the industry for several decades and uh, were in their second generation of ownership and management, took over Treview in 2011 with Treview House Proprietary Limited. We commenced working on the transaction in around mid-2010. The Whelans had very similar values to Treview's management team regarding staff and residents, and so it was a good fit at all levels. In fact, there was never a formal written contract between the parties, just a handshake uh, between Trevor Whelan and me. 
We agreed that Treasury should be expanded to 60 or 70 places to ensure site viability well into the future, and I agreed to take the proposal through to build, comp build completion. That required significant changes to the built structure, single storey to two storey for resident accommodation, a major challenge given Treasury's state heritage register listing. We also needed to have alternative accommodation for our 45 residents while that happened. <coughs> Partway through the process, Japara Limited, a Victorian based public company, sought to take over the Whelan, the Whelan organisation and in, in the end they were successful. There were some internal modifications to Treasury's redevelopment and in completion in 2014, Treasury became part of Japara and I ended my association with Treasury save for dealing with a small number of building issues over the next couple of years. So at a small stretch, it was about 40 years attached to Trevor. <coughs> in the same period as our transaction, 70% of the aged care facilities owned by families in South Australia changed hands to public companies or private equity. So while the Whelan family had the shortest ownership of Trevor, their commitment and capital input has had the most transformative effect of all the ownership periods, ensuring Trevor's longevity because there was no way uh, I could have generated the capital required. From my point of view, it was great working with Whelan's. I had huge input into the design and they understood and never questioned my desire to do long-run long maintenance restoration work that was not required by the contract with Japara. And that was a very complex contract. The, uh, the Whelan Care had three other facilities and that was relatively straightforward. If you think back to a, when, you, when you sell a house, you have a few pages of special conditions. There were 80 pages of special conditions in the Treasury contract. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a bit of a nightmare. I'll just finish those off. That was the men's shed which uh, Alan built um, and is now in the uh, front, on the site, the Land Avenue side garden of Treasury. And that's uh, one of the courtyards between the uh, outback building and the what we call the Kurong Wing. The garden that, uh, once again, Alan Wood built. Um, this is the first extension we did, and you can see just see the, the second and right there in the distance, the third. And uh, uh, a barn there that was part of the, uh, the original Treasure Estate. Um, front again. The Heritage Survey indicates that Treasury was built in 1866. However, in the early stages, we saw, that we saw that building workers had written on internal walls in the front room, what I call Stage 1, that they were there in 1860. The property was listed on the State Heritage Register in, in 1983, and the photo shows that we were part way through restoring the, uh, the verandas. Um, that was a major job. Um, the light wells it was, it was a solid fill veranda. It had uh, three or four layers of concrete because that's verandas had sunk. They just put a bit more concrete on, and that would have occurred in uh, uh, not just in Bill Blinman's time, but uh, uh, in the Taylor period as well, I imagine. Um, so all of that had to be pulled out um, and uh, uh, completely new veranda substance uh, structure uh, generated, which is now hollow and uh, effectively a wind tunnel, um, and that has. Uh, significantly ameliorated the, uh, the salt dam problem that existed in the basement. Um, when we took over, the rear of the property was a mess. Um, the, uh, there were bird cages, animal, struck animal cages. Um, Bill had a menagerie there that uh, had fallen into disuse. There were no animals there when we, uh, when we got there. Um, and I remember Bob Davies, who many people will remember, um, was cleaning up and he, uh, he pushed over a very large aviary up the back and uh, lifted up the concrete base and wondered what was underneath it and uh, went and had a look and it was a 135,000 litre tank that his nine tonne loader was just sitting on the top of chugging away. <laughs> um, it didn't break until years later but uh, it eventually had to be filled in. Um, I remember the the bill for the bill that we got the fill for free, but the bill for uh, carting the fill to the to the place was uh, was fourteen hundred dollars. It was an, an enormous hole in the ground. Now that was located in the courtyard near the rear of the building, uh, where um, 
the first extension I pointed out was uh, built, um, and uh, that required uh, some innovative and um, interesting substantial foundation uh, reinforcement, which has uh, stood the test of time because that uh, foundation work was done in the mid-90s um, and was reviewed by structural engineers uh, before the current uh, building was done at Treasury in 2012-2014. Uh, now the earliest photographic evidence we have at Treasury, uh, which many people have seen, dates back to 1922, um, when a uh, a couple pulled up outside the front of uh, Treffy when the frontage was at East Terrace and um, wondered what uh, was going on. They had the land for sale sign up um, and uh, they provided us with uh, these, these three photos um, which were dated 1922. And they actually, ref other than this bit here, uh, they reflect Treffy uh, structurally as, uh, as we found it in 76. And the only distinction is that it has the what was called a widow's walk, uh, and there was no evidence of that um, when we got there. Um, the interestingly, the barn that is to the um, south of Treview that uh, was on Eric Edwards' land, um, now at the back of the house, uh, has exactly the same balustrading as uh, as that, and uh, the same balustrading exists inside Treview and the staircase that goes into the roof space. I think that's uh, a photo of uh, what it looked like um, around about the time of the auction. You can see all of the, uh, the frontage was uh, covered in with cladding. Um, the veranda, I'm not sure whether, whether residents had lived in there or not, but, uh, or whether that was part of uh, Bill Blinman's flat. Um, we certainly used it as part of the flat. It was a very bumpy floor because uh, as I said, there have been concrete fill after concrete fill uh, over time. Um, the detail of the veranda here was the only bit that uh, we had that was reasonably original, um, and that's what we copied to uh, when um, we did the uh, veranda reconstruction. And that's what it looked like after we'd finished the veranda reconstruction. We had a little sunroom built here, and just this little edge here is... Uh, the first extension we did, um, which was done by Gawler Carpenters and Joiners. Um, interestingly, they were classified as the heritage colours of the day. Um, and the heritage colours change over time. Now, I'm sorry, this is very indistinct. That's the, this is the old treasury building here, and that's the basement. So you can see the basement fits pretty much straight over the top of the, um, of the front half of the building. We believe that this part of the building and the basement was stage one of James Martin's build. Um, so it was effectively a, an oversized double fronted cottage. Um, the timber embedded in the front wall indicated the veranda came straight out the front here, not as a return veranda. The current timbers that support the return veranda were attached to the embedded timbers at the front of the building and we discovered that when we replaced the veranda roof. There's, there was the existence of pointing uh, below the veranda, around here, um, which indicated that the veranda hadn't been there. Um, oh, sorry, that the, the veranda hadn't been around here at that point in time. The wall that runs north and south through the centre of the building, this one here, uh, has windows that look into here, they're sitting high up on the wall, they're now partially covered up with uh, fire stop jib rock, uh, as this now forms a, a, a dedicated fire compartment. So it was pretty clear, and there was, there was evidence of pointing on these walls here, on the outside of those walls. The next stage of the building, this block here, which I call the return veranda block, is probably um, uh, stage two, uh, and this building just butts up here. Um, the construction standard is uh, a much poorer quality than the construction standard here. And um, those people who knew Trevue uh, um, at the time probably agree with that. Um, 
The next stage, this one here and here, also just butted up and, uh, and again the, the quality of construction seemed to deteriorate. Now, in, I think it was 2014, or 2013, um, when we were partway through the, building the current uh, version of Treview, we discovered that there was, in this wall here, a, um, uh, an embedded roof um, that was two-thirds two -thirds up the 80-foot ceiling um, and indicated a building that would have come through here. But there was no evidence of a connection here. Um, so we're just never really sure um, whether this bit was built separately because that was uh, at some stage a very large kitchen for the, uh, for the property. Um, so we'll, we'll never know uh, what the, the exact sequence was uh, with, uh, with that change. James Martin passed away in 1899 and the engineering business went into receivership in, in um, 1910 um, and uh, some years ago I recall uh, being at uh, Riddell and Riddell when they discovered a whole heap of records and uh, they had the, uh, uh, the leather ledger um, where uh, the bookkeeper or accountant uh, for James Martin, uh, James Martin Engineering had signed off for the receivership. Um, I think it was taken over by what became John's Perry Engineering which also uh, um, passed into history uh, uh, eight or ten years ago. <coughs> now the name Treasury comes from Cornwall, which presumably is where James Martin came from. Uh, there are many established businesses, uh, including a Treasury House and a Treasury Road at Cranbourne in Cornwall. And subsequent owners to James Martin were the Taylor family, who owned the butter fa factory and purchased the estate, uh, purchased the, the, the property from James Martin's estate or his successors and owned it up until the time that Bill Blinman purchased it in 1954 from Mr W Taylor. Several generations of the Taylor family occupied Treasury and the, in the early 80s the uh, couple arrived at Treasury and the, uh, the, the lady had, who was well, the, 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 the wife had been brought up at Treasury by her grandparents um, as her parents had split up and they provided us with the, uh, the 1922 photos uh, sometime, late, sometime later. She described to me uh, how in uh, her early days her grandfather had the largest yacht in the southern hemisphere moored at Port Adelaide and when there were plays, operas etc at Her Majesty's Theatre she said that the cast would be entertained on the yacht and the food prepared was prepared in the large kitchen at the rear of Treview House. And she ac accurately described the tile colour and pattern that we, that we saw in what I've called uh, stage three of James Martin's build. And Colleen, you'd remember the, the coloured tiles in what was called the Blue Room? Um, they were the tile, exactly the tiles that this lady described that, uh, from her childhood. Later the house was uh, divided into two flats for two Taylor brothers and I understood from her that those flats were subsequently rented out to others, but I don't know when or for how long that occurred. It's hard to know how the building was divided. There is evidence in the central lounge, which has a timber ceiling that had a partition through it, but it's unclear where the bathrooms and kitchens were located for each flat. It may have been the flat that the Blinmans and uh, we lived in uh, that was part of the scheme, or maybe that was added on by Blinmans. same lady, sometime after her husband died, commissioned an artist to uh, paint Trevi as she remembered it. I met, met Ursula Kessling who uh, had notes from uh, the lady and uh, a number of questions she couldn't resolve. So we spent four or five hours poking around the property and other buildings of a similar age in Gawler and uh, Ursula produced that, uh, that painting of Trevi. And when I met the, uh, the person again with her granddaughter um, so she could have a last look through Treview in 2013, which substantially completed the new construction, um, but the original house was in considerable disarray because we'd torn bits of it to pieces. We were using it as uh, storage um, um, and um, tea rooms and things like that for contractors. Um, parts were locked up for other contractors, so it was... She, she still had an excellent recall 
of where everything was and uh, how she, uh, how the property was disposed when she was a child. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Blinman purchased the property in 1954, and I understand that they used it for their horses and also used the property as a reception house. And some years ago, Bruce Eastick told me that the Rotary Club held their meetings there for a period of time. I'm not quite sure how long that was. The Sunday Mail, uh, in an article, that's the lady there in 2013, with a couple of members of the Jewish family. And Craig Major, who still works at Treffy, no? used to work at Treffy for quite a number of years, um, found this and gave it to Alan. Um, that records that the property was converted to a private hospital for the elderly in 1963, so it had been operating for 13 years by the time it was sold by the public trustee on behalf of Bill Blimman's estate. It may have been this article that caused, created the view that Treasury was named after Treasury Fountain in Milan because that was uh, the prevailing view in Gore at the time. I don't believe any of the original staff, uh, of Bill's staff, remained when it was sold to us, but there are a fair proportion of staff who had been there for a good while. In the early 70s, there was effectively a federal government regulatory takeover of what were commonly known as old folks' homes or convalescent homes to lift the standard of those facilities and as a response to considerable community concern about the industry. The quid pro quo for funding of staff and consumables was then extensive and quite intrusive, regula intrusive regulation regarding operating standards, equipment, building maintenance and so on, where local government, state and federal governments all had a role. There was a fair bit of duplication and not a lot of coordination. This initiative to um, tidy up the industry uh, was fairly bipartisan, uh, and I think with much of the planning done in the Liberal government's time and the implementation fell to the Whitlam government, uh, and it was broadly a bipartisan approach, and that was pretty much the pattern that uh, we've seen in uh, aged care over the years. The effect of those regulations was to freeze profits permanently, only allowing fee increases matched by cost increases. The form filling was copious, the auditing intrusive and labour intensive, and while the public trustee, public trustee sort of kept up to it, um, it's quite possible in his latter years Bill was not able to, and as a result he was absorbing cost increases from profit level fixed in 1972. So it transpired, transpired to be quite a low-performing operation to its, compared to its peers and catch up on past cost increases was not an effective possibility. So what was it like when we found it and what did we do to it? The land was originally much larger and included Eric Edwards' property to the south, um, later re-subdivided by the Noak family. And when we purchased it was approximately four acres the barn that is on the adjoining property to the south, previously Eric's, uh, also has a basement and uh, that has the same features in it as, uh, as Treview. It's a half basement, what's well, tonight's full size basement uh, with a ground floor. Um, there was a staircase entrance into the, into the basement from, um, from the Treview side, but that had obviously been blocked off some years ago, and the only entrance is from the householder's side. The shed at the rear of Treview was uh, stables and about double the present size. Uh, that part was in poor condition and we demolished that uh, in and around mid, in the mid-2000s. And um, that would have made way for our last, uh, our last development. That would have housed uh, carriages. Adjoining were a couple of tap rooms running back up the hill uh, along the Land Avenue and they were also in very poor condition. Along the same line, there were several further individual stables that had all but fallen, but fallen down. In the paddock behind, there are a number of horse troughs where there are now houses, and in the second property behind Treview is the original slaughterhouse walls, which I believe those people have converted to a studio. The gardens were generally run down, particularly at the rear, it was something of a jungle. The enclosures were where Bill kept his menagerie, were completely overgrown and run down, as was the remainder of the rear of the property. Weeds, much of it around uh, four foot high. Two of the three arches at the entrance of the building were uh, beginning to collapse. The building was somewhere between very tired and seriously run down. State and federal health departments and local boards of health had many orders on the property regarding its operation as a nursing home. Uh, 
interestingly, many orders were repeated each year, and some had been in place for quite some years, and went to almost every facet of the building and nursing home operation. Um, some years after, uh, we bought it, uh, um, a chap called Mike Starlin off, who's now passed away, was a senior government health official, and he's, he told me stories about uh, how Bill had a, uh, a sixth sense about when the inspectors were coming. Um, <laughs> mobile phones hadn't been invented by then, but Bill seemed to know, and he was always attacking one of the orders um, somewhere in the bowels of the business when, uh, when they came to find him. And uh, he'd say, you know, all right, all right, leave me alone, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to it. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't necessarily say to his credit, but uh, he got away with it for a long time. The property was a 27-place nursing home and relied upon the original building's effluent systems. The tanks were pumped out every couple of, a couple of times a week in winter. Uh, I think that was Alan's dad that did that. Uh, so no wonder Eric Edwards Almond's treated it so well. <laughs> when I inspected the basement pre-purchase, there was serious salt damp. Salt, salt stalactites, I'm not sure which ones, stalactites or stalagmites, but were growing out of the wall, you know, three or four inches long. It was just amazing. Um, and in some sections, particularly on the northeastern corner, the walls were fretted away by 30 to 50 per cent. The only way to access the basement was to break a window pane and crawl through. And uh, it had been so long since anybody had been in there, the, the ceiling heights were about 10 foot, and you had to bend down to about this high to avoid the, the cobwebs that were just hanging down. It was really quite eerie. It was clear that nobody had been in the basement for many years. The timber panelling below the basement windows, which went all the way to the floor, um, and the associated architrave showed watermarks some 75 to 100 millimetres above the floor, indicating the presence of free water for extended periods of time. The gutters were falling apart, so there was no stormwater uh, removal from the building. The septic tanks were adjacent to the southern side of the building, so that probably explains much of the basement damage. And in some areas, the salt dam was also making its present cell on the ground floor well above ground level. The spiral staircase balustrading was all over the basement floor, but most of the pieces were in surprisingly good condition. Uh, there was only two pieces that we had to resurrect. The rest of them were, uh, were there. Um, the nurse's station sat above the stairwell, and the stairs and the, building, uh, the, stairs and the balustrading were about 50% um, demolished. The water supply of the building was a corroded half-inch main coming from Trevia's East Terrace entrance and the water supply to the flat where we lived for a time uh, and the two bathrooms for 27 residents was quite limited and seriously impaired if somebody else was using the water. So sharing was a challenge and it was a challenge temperature-wise as well but pretty much always on the cold side. Heating was by strip radiators, they made a toping effort and there was no cooling. So in heatwave conditions the building heated up and stayed that way. The only saving grace was it took a fair while to warm up in winter time. Oh, sorry, cool down in winter time. The equipment, even for the day, was definitely in the veteran, if not the antique class. If you watch um, sort of World War II movies um, and see hospitals, those cast iron bed heads, that was uh, that was the standard uh, the standard furniture trivia at the time. Um, it was uh, it was interesting. One of the orders was that. Uh, these beds, all these beds had to be repainted. Um, and I remember being in the basement, uh, turning it into a, um, a spray booth, uh, ripping them all apart and painting them one by one, uh, fairly, on, fairly early on on weekends. Uh, I got the impression that the staff were in fact quite loyal to him. So whatever, whatever his faults may have been, I was left with the impression that with the limited means of the industry at the time, and perhaps his own resources, Together with the storm of regulation you'd have faced from the early 70s, Bill didn't do such a bad job of owning the facility. Uh, despite the dearth of leadership when we got there, no new investment, cost cutting from the public trustee, the staff were pretty resilient, un resilient and unified as a group, doing the best they could for the residents of the day. They were formally led by matron Joyce Nottle, sisters Pat Snugs, Delia Close, and informally by some strong personalities amongst the nurse assistants and ancillary staff, and, and I guess from time to time people, the staff fell into two loose groups, sometimes welcoming change, 
and sometimes resisting change as, uh, as they effectively lost uh, what had been their autonomy for some considerable period of time. But it was pretty clear that change had to occur. So what we did to the property and, uh, and who did it? Um, the immediate task was to establish the maintenance capacity and deal with the internals of the building, essentially to catch up on pretty basic maintenance throughout the home. That was followed by creating and upgrading of facilities, laundry, bathrooms, plumbing and attacking the external jungle. The external cladding was pulled off the veranda and new woodwork, restoring much of the original features was, uh, was installed. This included dismantling the crumbling brick-like tunnels to the basement, removing the solid fill veranda floors and replacing with oak flooring to create a wind tunnel to dry up the walls of the basement. The dampness in the, in the solid fill floors had actually risen about 600 mils, 700 mils above ground level. Uh, so bad was the, uh, uh, the, the roof drainage. Much of the driveway side of the building was repointed and the building was repainted supposedly in heritage colours. I was never really keen on the green, but there you go. They have they've had a considerable variation over time. A fire compartment was installed separating the ground floor into two one-hour compartments and the basement into another compartment uh, and at the same time the basement was renovated to become offices and staff room. We installed full fire detection systems connected to the MFS. That was the first for uh, Gawler Healthcare buildings and indeed one of the first uh, in the region. Internal renovations and the arches to the arches were done by uh, the maintenance team of Wally Jackson, who was with Treby for 28 years, George Bailey and Arch McDonald, while the plumbing was done by Bill Sneesby and electrical by Errol Congdon. Peter Hatcher, with assistance from Sal De Palma and his backhoe, were responsible for uh, the veranda restoration, which is still largely in place nearly 40 years later. Hatch, with uh, help from Peter Knight, was also responsible for much of the fire compartmentation and a replacement of a number of internal floors. And the replacement of those internal floors was a pretty complex task because the nursing home was a very crowded building with uh, then 30 people in it. And uh, so the floors had to be replaced around, uh, around residents. It wouldn't be possible today. Around that period, we subdivided the, uh, the land and uh, firstly sold off these three blocks um, uh, from the East Terrace frontage and then three from the rear. These blocks of land I think we sold for twelve and a half thousand dollars each um, and they were the highest priced blocks of land in Gordon at the time. Mm. Uh, I guess it's changed a bit since then. The, the re this, this reef up here particularly uh, required the gates to be relocated from East Terrace to Deland Avenue and that was part of a some sort of a side deal with uh, Bob Walter, who was the, uh, the then town planner. The, um, that was actually done before the, uh, uh, the heritage listing, uh, the, 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 before the heritage listing happened, and um, uh, Bob came to me and said, well, you can have this re-subdivision, um, provided you sign here and you put the gates about, oh, somewhere there. So I said, okay, we'll do that. The gate relocation was a major operation. Um, we borrowed a rock drill from a, uh, a granite quarry north of Canberra to split up the walls and pillars into appropriate sections. The pillars were then wrapped up in reinforcing steel by Ian Dawes so they could be individually lifted and relocated. Lifting frames were created for the walls to reduce the risk of collapse. Bramble's cranes did the move with an expert rigger from Sydney and the structure was placed on uh, new foundations on the Land Avenue. Key to the move were uh, Arch McDonald and uh, Wally Jackson, as I mentioned, uh, Ian Dorr. Um, that work uh, was uh, fairly amusing for the neighbours. Uh, most people thought it was going to fall to bits, um, but we managed to get uh, each piece there and in place uh, to their uh, current location. The first extension was in 83. It was four sharing built on the southwestern side of the building. That was Arch McDonald and the, the New Gates location. So the this was the first extension here. Um, and the second extension was 
this one here, not this bit here, but all of this here. Uh, and that was, uh, that was pretty challenging. Um, the building provided one share room and 13 single rooms, which was uh, uh, certainly unheard of uh, in, uh, in the immediate region at the time. Uh, there was no increase in the then 38 places, so there was further significant renovation in Treasury as it reduced from 38 places inside the old building to 23 places, eliminating some large awards and creating more internal and exter external rec recreation places and a kitchen upgrade. Part of the uh, project was the installation of the sprinkler system throughout the property and we also replaced the, uh, the old building roof. The work was done by local contractors working together, David Teckle, Peter Cleland with plumbing, Bob Moritz Electrical, plus a full upgrade of all the electrics and switchboards, all over be assisted by uh, Wally Jackson, who was then our sole uh, maintenance guy, and to a lesser extent by me. At this time, we were almost able to fully re-equip Treview. Uh, all high-low beds, mostly other than eight, mostly electric, uh, new furniture, soft furnishings, wall hangs, that comprised a pretty decent standard for the time. The funding for this project was partly from internal savings, small-scale land redevelopment with, uh, with others, house renovation and sale, and a medium-term medium assurance from the federal government of a subsidy equivalent to a portion of the interest cost of the project um, and increased bank lending. After the conclusion of that project, Trevi came were pretty happy with what we achieved. Most of us remembered what Trevi was like um, when it was a place that you went to because there was nowhere else. And at last we felt we had a, a halfway decent offering for the community. And looking back, that wasn't surprising perhaps, as Trevi had been the ugly duckling uh, facility for many years. And in compensation for this, Trevi people worked really hard to provide the best pair they could, and that culture was established before my time and we were lucky enough for it to remain and grow for uh, much of the time to a stable, enthusiastic and competent team of, of staff and senior staff. I remember being told in early days by senior RN Pat Snokes that Dr Deland reckoned we had the best care uh, in Gawler and as I didn't know Dr Deland much, I always hoped that was true but of course you can never be sure. Staff were uh, generally pretty competitive and it was always a badge of honour when, and staff room chatter when people selected Trevue on positive grounds and especially if our vacancy filled before other local facilities. The third extension uh, was conceived, this one here in 2001 and created late 2003 or, or early 2004. Uh, the extension was again to the east and we had courtyards in, in all these areas between the buildings. Um, Again, the project was delivered uh, pretty much on a cost-plus basis um, by David Teckle, Bob Moritz, Fluid Pumming, Jeff Kennewell, Wally Jackson and this time Alan Woods. For us, this really completed the Trevi project that, uh, that, and the Trevi presented looked good and uh, presented a very competitive aged care offering for the medium-term future. We'd gone as far as the land and the business financial capacity could go. So Trevi today, as I mentioned earlier, it was clear that the industry was going to consolidate. Scale of facility and larger groups of facilities would become the order of the day. Small single operator facilities would cease to be viable. While Trevi was doing well, and from my point of view very well, it was clear that it had to become part of a larger group to ensure, ensure long run site, site viability, i.e. 20 years plus, uh, and that needed to be more than 60 places. Around 2010, Will and Care, who operated three homes, agreed to take on Treview. I'd worked with Trevor and Carol Whelan as director of the Industry Association for over 20 years. Our management team was like-minded with Whelan's regarding resident care and working with staff, so it was a good fit. We had three key issues to deal with. 20 plus new bed licence approvals to obtain, design and approve Treview's next extension, bearing in mind the, uh, the heritage listing, and uh, of course we had to accommodate Trevi's 45 residents during the project. So we were granted uh, 24 licences as a result of the 2010 uh, Federal Government tender and extensive and positive uh, engagement with Council Planning and Heritage Officers. Uh, we finalised our design after a few planning issues uh, obtained consent. Some years prior, ECH, who then owned James Martin, 
uh, vacated James Martin Nursing Home and the whole site had been on the market for some time. Eventually we, which was by then Wheel and Care, came together with Gordon to 6H Cottage Homes and we purchased the site with them taking the retirement units and us taking the basic, vacant nursing at the time and from memory I think the deal was financed by Wheel and Care initially. We also applied for 30 bed licences for James Martin Nursing Home to be eventually run in conjunction with Treasury as there were no homes on that side of Gawler and there were identified needs in terms of the federal government's position, uh, needs position, uh, for areas on arterial roads to Williston, um, Barossa and uh, the Lower North. We saw a future need for another full-size facility so we built into the James Martin nursing home a new kitchen and laundry to suit 70 plus beds and renovated the balance of the facility as the nursing home had to be recertified as it uh, had been vacant for so long. We did that with a score of uh, 85 out of 100, which was about average for many newer facilities. Regrettably, uh, our licence application for that site failed. The Department of Health gave 100 bed licence approval 600, mile, 600 metres up the road, up Carlton Road from Treview, and 1,200 metres up the road from Martindale. Never to be built, and now apparently withdrawn. You could say what the... Mm. We could have and should have probably gone to uh, appeal and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, but we had plenty on our plate. While we had been working together for some time, we actually didn't get around until transacting Treview until November 2011. I continued as CEO of Treview for a short time and joined the Wheel and Care Executive that uh, ran the four facilities as Special Projects Manager. My major focus was the redevelopment of James Martin Nursing Home, which we called Treview at Williston, and after, after everybody moved to Williston, the Treview project occupied me until its completion in 2014. And the other project I had on the plate was uh, um, preparing the four facilities for uh, the changes that would occur in aged care from uh, uh, 1st of July 2014. At Treview at Williston and the Gawler project, we again decided to work as uh, owner builders and develop a team of contractors who had multi story uh, qualifications and experience, and many had a warm up with us at Williston. The group was led by Nick Weissband and Luke Scott, both locals. Who, who had a low-snit team of associated contractors. Our architect was former Gawler boy, Steve Peter Stansborough. The plan was essentially to build two storeys on top of the extension foundations that had been done in the mid-90s and early 2000s as the engineering reports which we'd retained stacked up for the uh, construction that we had in mind. There was additionally a small northern extension to the middle building, which is this little bit here. And from memory, just to give you an idea how things have changed. This occupied 27 people and went up to 38 people, went down to 23, um, and we only added seven extra beds to the 38 with a 16 bed extension here. Um, so we had um, uh, eight two bedrooms in, uh, in the complex and everything else was a private room. Now, it's uh, all ensuite bathroom, uh, private room ensuite bathroom. Mm. So the, the plan to go two storey necessitated destroying much of what we built in the, these two buildings. Um, and I know David Teckle was quite sad about it, uh, but uh, I had to make the point to him that if, if we, he, hadn't built what we had done and, and made it work, none of none of what followed could have occurred. Our plan allowed for 71 places, all private room with ensuite bathroom. We could see the government was issuing licences to try and ensure that all facilities had some vacant beds to ensure choice for consumers. Some 25 to 30 per cent of facilities still had very high occupancies, 98 per cent plus, while the average was then 91 or 92 per cent. Treffy was always in the high occupancy group. However, from a planning and operational point of view, maintaining an occupancy of 60 residents was necessary for staffing efficiency, so he reasoned that we did need spare capacity. And high occupancy was a bit of a problem for us personally. My, my partner's mother passed away in another nursing home while waiting for a place at Treadview with James Martin when Peter and Bruce owned it. My mum had to wait four or five months before she could get a vacancy. When we had completed
completed the framework for uh, all of this. It's a two-story project. Um, Chaparra Healthcare approached Wheel and Care to buy us out. After considerable soul searching, family and advisor discussion, and subsequent negotiation, it was agreed that Japara take over Wheel and Care. It was a pretty sad event for uh, the Wheel and family and ourselves, um, but the, uh, um, we didn't really see an alternative. There were some design changes, and the facility was set at 68 places. Primarily, as Japara didn't want to use the basement offices as we, as we had. The sale of Trevue settled in 2014 and Japara moved the residents from Williston to Trevue shortly afterwards and the facility at Williston, unfortunately, has remained vacant since. Mm. The Wheelan family and I are delighted with the final build at Trevue and we hope it serves the Gawler community very well, uh, as well as preserving Trevue's heritage. It's worth coming on, commenting on the transaction because there is a connection to the current circumstances of aged care. During the period of our transaction, around 70% of the family-owned facilities and a couple of larger charitable groups transferred to public company or private ownership. The 2014 aged care reforms were well understood by the industry during the prior years and it was recognised that it will be a financial engineering opportunity as bonds, now known as RADs, will be permitted in high care which was being aligned with low care. This was seen as transformational for high care balance sheets and result in a rash of transactions that boosted prices in a way that we could see would not be repeated for many years, if ever. And I think that's proven to be true. Um, we also held the view that as deposit interest rates were collapsing, there was little to be earned in, from the future influx of bonds. That meant viability would have to rely on making a surplus um, from uh, the eroding per capita funding provided by the government and the limited funding by residents. The industry experienced per capita funding erosion for 16 of my last 17 years and we thought that as the government saw the influx of millions of dollars, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in refundable deposits combined with budget deficits, care funding cuts were on the way. The industry was also at the top of its game on working the aged care funding system and it was clear that revisions would result and they did. A funding freeze for one year and another year that cut the guts out of funding for the most dependent dementia, dementia residents and then back to discounting funding of indexa discounted indexation of care costs. I should talk about Trevue and its people because the, the building isn't much without the people. Trevue's development as a building as an aged care facility is largely due to its people. It's not possible to name everybody but there are many stalwarts of every Trevue era, era um, and the people who are on the management team. When it started in 76, or well, when we started in 76, it was Matron Joyce Nottle, Sisters Pat Snug, Delia Close, Sister M. Woods, Mary and Tom Woods, Betty Smith, Colleen, Dora, were you there? You were there, weren't you, Colleen? Yeah. Um, Andrew Jeffrey was the Director of Nursing for 19 years and provided much additional insight into dementia, into dementia management. He was backed up by Meredith Allen as 2IC for most of his time. Meredith succeeded Andrew as Director of Nursing for uh, eight years of her 24 years service and Meredith had Jan Lewis as uh, her 2IC for, about eight, for those eight years of her 21 years service and Jan also backed up Karen Cowman and was succeeded by Michelle Shapelius Michelle for several years before Trevi was taken over. Sharon Henderson was our Quality and Safety Coordinator from the end of Andrew's time until Japara's, approaching two decades of incredibly valuable service to the management team, staff and residents, leading to service quality and productivity improvements and award-winning safety achievements. When Trevi was absorbed by Wheel and Care, Sharon took over quality assurance and safety for the group and the other facilities benefited from the extension of the system she developed at Trevi. Many of the people who were in the management team at Trevue uh, served on committees such as Share and Care, Alzheimer's Committee, Gawler Health Service Board and Malawi Community Hospital. There are also a number of staff who made very significant contributions to the quality and, consistencies of, and consistency of Trevue's offering. Mark, Mark Tobin, Joyce Donald's daughter, was uh, spent 20 years running our office on a very part-time basis. Wally Jackson, 28 years of... Uh, patching up second-hand equipment to garden maintenance and all manner of building maintenance and, and development. 
Alan Woods, son of Mary and Tom, who briefly worked at Trevi as a 15-year-old and who succeeded Wally and continues at Trevi as a very valued member of Japara staff. June, June Houlihan, as an RN, led a number of significant improvements in dementia care as well as being an RN with around 20 years service. Charles Jenning and Pauline Sutton ran catering for well over 20 years. We were also very well served by some local suppliers. Tony Lagana for our fresh veggies and for a period also helped us supply Erna Bella with fresh veggies when my brother was an RN up there. My brother said that the prices were cheaper than Adelaide uh, in the Adelaide market and even after spending four or five, six days in an unrefrigerated truck, the quality was pretty good. Tony, Tony when he put his mind to it, had a really good talent for uh, making those things work. David Feats manufactured most of our joinery, was lower priced and much more durable than stuff that was purpose built for aged care. Russell Edgecombe guided our IT development from the mid 80s when Commodores were also computers. Um, mm. That relationship facilitated many product productivity improvements and cost efficiencies well in advance of what was common in the sector. We had the benefit of a talented IT group that also serviced EDS when it was contracted out by the state government, police, premier's office, the LTO, amongst major insurers and others. Um, Gaul has had, for many years, I don't know whether it's still the case, two large GP practices. And this has been most advantageous as Trevi residents uh, were and possibly still are serviced by two GPs, David London, now retired, and Michael Brown. Those relationships are critical to their patients, Trevi residents, and the relationship between key nurses and GPs, in my view, is a great asset to resident care and nursing home performance, as there are quite frequently uh, triangular relationships with family members. I know it's really hard for nursing staff when a GP has only one or two patients. It's very hard to get them to visit regularly. GP patients in this area are also an issue. GP rounds with lots of residents have been criticised as being money-making for GPs and uh, the government hated them um, and uh, regularly looked at uh, GPs who did that work. Um, and uh, GPs who only had three or four residents um, were very hard to get on site and uh, their problem was that there was insufficient funding to make it worthwhile leaving their surgery. So we were pretty lucky in Google because that situation was very rare in, uh, in, uh, in urban areas. You could have a, a large facility where uh, um, you could have um, no more than half a dozen residents uh, with one GP practice. Um, and so you just didn't get the same quality of service from uh, GPs for the staff and, uh, and their residents. When we started Trevi, the people who came to us did so because there was nowhere else. Uh, the reputation wasn't great despite the, the efforts of staff. And I guess the aged care industry has changed a bit because between Gawler and Jeps Cross, there, were, there was only one nursing home, two in Gawler and one at Salisbury that was a 30 bed facility. Mm. And now there's almost one on every corner. So we inherited an approach where anybody, anybody could go to Trevi and we maintained that over the years so we accommodate a number of Gawler characters, Gawler's characters, rough sleepers, itinerant pensioners and so on. And that generally worked pretty well. And from a competitive point of view, I always figured there was a lot more milk than there, uh, under, the, under, the, under the cream. Uh, I remember a chap called Wes, who an indictment on our, our mental health and social services at the time, spent decades at uh, Glenside um, and at one point absconded from Treview and uh, it was getting dark, the local police and we were making no progress. Um, the local guys said, try ringing central operations because they won't do anything for us, so I did that. Um, and Wes had previously escaped from a lock ward at Glenside and they found him three weeks later uh, in a four-star hotel <laughs> in Melbourne. <laughs> and they had absolutely no intention of going looking for Wes. <laughs> so, Wes was found next morning um, sleeping on the riverbank and was quite happy. Um, but he always had this mantra that he wanted to go to Kangaroo and never explained why. So Andrew Jeffrey did that, took him there. He found his parents' grave and was happily ever after. Never responded again um, and uh, started communicating and uh, was pretty much a normal person. So you wonder 
what had happened to him for uh, three or four decades in, in, the, in the mental health system of the day. There was a matron, Sampson, and she was called matron because she knew everything that went on. That was Sister Inwood's mum. Um, there was um, a lady who, um, uh, I won't use her name, um, because the family's still around. Uh, when the Taylor family came to visit, this lady never spoke to her husband. They'd sit outside in the veranda and he'd look that way and she'd look that way. Um, no communication at all. So this couple came in to look through Trevju. The, uh, the, the husband was quite a tall chap, 6'2", um, quite elderly and quite stooped. And uh, Mrs X took a liking to him and um, uh, walked up to him, tickled his chin and, uh, and said how much she'd like to take him home or even to bed. <laughs> she, 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 had, she had a very eventful afternoon. The, uh, the husband turned bright red. The wife didn't know what to do. So their visit to, that visit to Trevi was very short. <laughs> and um, Mrs X and her husband continued visiting. He continued visiting and, was, and she looked that way, he looked that way. And there was no talking. So we don't know what happened. And then there was Bill. Bill slept in two chairs pushed together. He had a bed, of course, but uh, he didn't want to sleep in a bed. Um, and uh, he was invaluable in picture selection for one of the new buildings, for this one here, in fact. Um, and so during construction, we walked around um, him with visibly saturated trousers, refusing assistance, sometimes aggressively. Um, so he, he hated uh, anything to do with continence management. Um, until before mealtime when he'd, uh, he would capitulate invariably. And there was Jack, who uh, his last job before he came to Treview, we understood, was patrolling the dog fence. He wore old army boots but never socks, and he said he had his first girlfriend in, in Treview. So we weren't too sure about that, because the, uh, but the lady concerned was reputedly uh, a lady of the night um, in Treview some years prior. So. Don't know about that. <laughs> we didn't select residents based on the care dollars they could be assessed at, and, and it was common for aged care facilities to do that. Uh, and that assisted, from our point of view, in a very positive relationship with the local hospital and also Lyle McEwen. And it stood us in good stead with the uh, people we accommodated on a hospital, hospital discharge policy priority basis and otherwise from the community on a needs basis. And that was probably one of the reasons for the long-lasting high occupancy percentage that was and, as I understand, is uh, essential to financial viability. Um, some of our aged care highlights, as I mentioned, were the first building in the region to have proper fire compartmentation and fire detection systems. Um, we were one of the first in uh, South Australia to computerise clinical management and we presented on a national, at a National Aged Care IT conference on the topic. There were uh, Meredith, Jan, June, Sharon and many others, and it took a year to consolidate. Um, it resulted in significant reductions in our end time, meaning more time with residents and staff and families. Um, one of the important results was more consistency in resident assessment leading to improved care dollars as much as the Department of Health auditors disliked it. And they were really quite aggressive about disliking um, systems where they couldn't entrap you because uh, there was a degree of consistency, so it was very hard for them to knock back your assessments. There's also an increased amount of information for staff about people's personal histories, enabling a better understanding by staff and more connection abilities between staff and residents. It also enabled vastly better oversight for nursing management. After a weekend or any time uh, you are away, um, you are able to call up progress notes for residents uh, and get a fast view of what was happening while you are off duty. It was never possible to do that with paper records and uh, verbal handovers had to be too brief uh, to be nearly as effective, but in some ways it made short verbal handovers more, more effective. Uh, staff massage and physio programs for new mums returning to work were introduced and that earned us a statewide safety award in 2004. Um, it was interesting, we, 
we didn't really think much about it. Um, and the people who were responsible for the state safety awards kept ringing us and saying, when are you coming? And we said, no, it was $100 a head. Okay. And we said, no. <laughs> so eventually they paid for us, <laughs> and then we found out why. <laughs> um, it was interesting that year, BHP uh, had the, uh, won the prize for the, uh, the, best, the best safety thing. Later, this program extended to personal counselling and several hours of free physio for staff each week, an approach copied from David Whelan, who took a professional sports approach of in to injury management. So regardless of the injury cause, um, the team members were wanted back on the park as soon as possible. And over time, these approaches had positive effects, positive spin-off effects in staff resilience, injury causation reduction, reporting and, and remediation. It was interesting, staff were very willing to chat to the physio uh, while they're on the table about uh, issues that they never, never occurred to them to report. Um, and that resulted in quite a number of safety resolutions at an early and low-key stage. And of course that builds uh, effective long-run working relationships. <coughs> These initiatives at Treasury and Whelan Care resulted in a 2009 project with UniSA, researching the development of what was called the psychosocial, psychosocial safety climate in aged care. Both Carol Whelan and I were on the steering committee of that project. That involved psychometric testing and analysis of staff attitudes, psychologist interviews with staff groupings, together with physiotherapy interventions along the lines I outlined. The project was developed by our association with UniSA and funded by EML, who was then the work cover insurer. The project was so successful um, that work cover and then later return to work expanded and continued with the project for a further five or six years. In the first trial, the six homes um, of the six homes, Treview and uh, one of the wheel and care facilities, demonstrated the best outcome, which co correlated very highly with low staff turnover and low injury rates. So we figured we were pretty much on the right course. The Treview management uh, team approach to productivity and safety led to uh, some other firsts. Um, we bought uh, a couple of things called Vendlet machines in 2005. The first time I saw it and tried it, I just had to have one. If you can picture two roller blinds sitting at the side of the bed where the bed rails might be, um, and under, on top of the mattress um, there was a, a, a slide sheet of sorts, and the two roller blinds operated in concert. So one rolled up and the other one unrolled. So while the person was lying on the bed, the sheet moved under them and they just quietly rolled over without a, without a person touching them. Um, <laughs> there aren't too many of them around. <laughs> um, they ruined about 10,000 each. Um, but they did allow residents to be re repositioned without touching them. Now, it's very important for frail aged people with challenging skin conditions. And additionally, it was very important with very heavy residents. Care workers work in pairs, um, and when a very heavy resident requires more than two carers, productivity for a whole shift uh, is compromised. And that leads to care shortcuts, staff wear and tear, and injuries. Um, so at Treview, at, at that stage, um, you'd have three nursing care teams, three teams of personal care workers, and if you damage one team by taking one person away from it, that really stopped the effectiveness of the second team. So it became a, it became a real problem. We also invested in the process of sealing monorails to move very heavy residents. We had one of the two Vendlet units in South Australia and Wheel and Care had the others and we later shared them on a uh, needs basis. We also invested quite heavily over time in uh, pressure relieving mattresses, particularly alternating air pressure mattresses. The last one I bought was uh, for my mother who was in post-hip post fracture recovery in a public hospital who didn't have any. The devices released, and it was a major problem actually. I mean the, the public health care system did have them but they'd run out of them and uh, they weren't about to uh, find, if that, find out if there were any spares anywhere else in the uh, public hospital network. So I, I bought one that was um, the same brand and type as uh, theirs and then somebody, some contractor had to come and electrically test it because they didn't have anybody to electrically test it on site and so on. So anyway, we got that fixed. These devices reduced the need to reposition a resident with compromised skin condition by about 50%. So instead of somebody having to be repositioned every two hours, you could comfortably reposition people every, every four hours. 
And that was good for the resident concerned, as people with frail skin bruise very easily. Um, it was also uh, good for uh, staff in not having to participate in difficult manhandling exercises, as well as providing more productive resident facing time overall. All facilities were expanding in areas, private rooms, ensuite bathrooms, carpet versus hard floor coverings, wheeled trolleys of all sorts became fatiguing for staff. Um, I remember one, one particular enrolled nurse who did medication rounds talking about impact on her wrists and elbows, pushing, stopping and starting pushing the megatrachin trolley, which is a fairly heavy, fairly heavy beast. Um, and it stopped it and started you know, many times in a day. So uh, we started looking at uh, motorisation um, and uh, we came across uh, a solution in Victoria which cost uh, about $3,000 each. Uh, we regarded that as uh, unaffordable and by chance I came across a chap called Alex Neal at Phantom Power Products at Tepperton in Adelaide uh, and together with Gawler based industrial designer John Packer we produced a motorised device for moving heavy aged care comfort chairs. Uh, and a bolt-on motor system for catering, medication, laundry, delivery trolleys that hitherto staff pushed for kilometres a day. Trivia ended up with 10 motorised devices that cost between $700 and $1,000 at a time. Encouraged and perhaps driven by Sharon Henderson, Alex and I put our prototype in the, in the SA Safety Awards in 2006 and won the $10,000 prize, together with the second prize for the most innovative safety invention. We were, we were beaten by the CFS fire truck that could withstand burnovers and, had, and they'd made major sales of it, so we felt pretty good about coming second. Now, not everything worked out so well. Uh, one time we were looking at a new kind of patient lifter. It had a spade-like thing that was supposed to protrude and come forward while you sat in a chair and went under your bottom to then lift you up. So if you just picture yourself sitting there watching this spade-like thing come towards you. <laughs> we didn't end up buying it, but the, uh, there was a bit of, bit of a laugh in the staff room after that event um, because uh, nurses can be pretty cruel. Um, they reckoned that the bloke uh, that's selling it had a, uh, had a fairly high-pitched voice for a reason. <laughs> Some years later, in 2008, I think it was, we invested in electronic shower chairs. So instead of care workers having to bend and kneel and stand up straight multiple times while showering a resident in a standard shower chair, these things lifted and reclined the resident to the desired working height and position for the staff member. Probably wasn't the most popular thing I did because I described it as lifting and separating, a bit like a burly bra. <laughs> However, the device did work quite well at reducing fatigue and wear and tear on staff body, so it was well worth the investment of five and a half grand per chair versus the standard chair at around six hundred dollars. In 2009 we were the first uh, organisation to computerise care manage, uh, medication management with a New South Wales uni company. Uh, we were a demonstration project for Australia and New Zealand. That's the bend lifting thing. These photocopies didn't turn out too well did they? Yeah. This uh, radically reduced medication areas, er, errors, including those, originated in the, uh, those that originated in the pharmacy. So it was great for efficiency and slashing the time to investigate medication areas. Um, so similar advantages in RN efficiency and therefore more resident facing time. The system also facilitated close audit, audit, auditing of medication processes uh, and nursing management could log on and watch medication management dispensing remotely at any time. And we did find uh, one RN who was very short serving um, that was doing the, uh, the, the evening drug round at tea time, combined with the tea time round, uh, because it was just very much more efficient for her. Um, staff weren't, uh, weren't forthcoming with the news, but um, when you logged on, you could see what medications were being went remotely, you could see what medications were being dispensed and uh, it was pretty clear what was going on, so that, uh, that came to a very short end. Um, <coughs> uh, we ended up with a, a broadband computer kiosk for residents as a demonstration project uh, which was funded by NEC and the government. And there were small things. Um, when new residents arrived, there would be a welcome card on their uh, bed from domestic staff who would introduce themselves. 
cleaners, laundry and catering staff also saw a lot of residents and it helped to build a relationship with people who cleaned their room, delivered their laundry and cooked your meals. Um, and that was pretty much courtesy of Sharon and Meredith who saw that sort of customer service as a very key part of doing our job. Now, over a number of years, the courtyards and the main lounge at Trevi were converted to have uh, wall, wall decorations, sculptures, paintings, wall paintings, century garden and men's shed, which was used, the men's shed was used by the Alzheimer's Association in their training packages for many years. These developments were initiated and guided by June Houlihan, Alan Wood, Sharon Henderson and Michelle, Pe Michelle Shapilius over a period. And Trevi received an aged care standards agency award and Sharon spoke about that at uh, the annual aged care conference that year. Resident staff involvement and the continuing use of those areas for helping residents, uh, especially those with wandering dementia. And as I pointed out earlier, the, the men's shed is uh, now in the garden. Um, so those were some of our highlights. Um, not everything worked well for residents and staff, and I know all of the people I've mentioned and others faced their difficult times at Trevi, and that's still the case in the aged care industry. I know that when Andrew, Meredith, Jan, Sharon, Karen and Michelle and many others were tired or left Trevi. They felt a great responsibility lifted from them. For my part, uh, my blood pressure medication halved, chest pain was gone, um, and now my blood pressure comfortably sits in the normal range for the first time in a few decades. Now I can't miss the opportunity to talk about, to make some comments about our aged care funding and regulation system, which started in the early 70s and is currently the subject of a Royal Commission. Every funding and regulation system has had two key features in my view. A quite high degree of liberal labour bipartisanship, one planning the changes and often the succeeding government doing the implementation. Most recently, Labor Minister Mark Butler planned the, the changes and, imp and the Liberals implemented pretty much 100% of those changes with effect from 1st of July 2014. The other key thing was governments and the Department of Health appear to have had a firm but absolutely unstated desire to ensure there was absolutely no linkage between the quantum of funding and the actual cost of resident care needs. Um, things like relative care needs indicators, so this person could have a bit more, but that person, that person needed a bit less, um, but it didn't matter that the amount was uh, insufficient for either. I particularly recall a senior Labor Federal Cabinet Minister publicly instructing Premiers Kane and Bannon that if they wanted fancy nursing care, they could pay for it. And as both, governments, both state governments were inclined to recommended staffing ratios, the federal government proceeded to cut funding to South Australian and Victorian homes. A similar storm er erupted when Southern Cross commenced hiring enrolled nurses over personal care workers. And now the industry is being publicly criticised for substituting enrolled nurse time uh, for RN time as an efficiency. Every inquiry was and is currently precipitated by a combination of publicity about unsatisfactory care episodes and a financial crisis in the industry. But politicians in government remain ever vigilant in keeping the two matters of funding and care standards separate. And as a public, we inevitably only hear about the former. In the early 70s and 80s, there were a significant number of test cases in the federal court system aimed at breaking down the often irrational funding approach. In the mid-80s, there was, there was regular, a regular procession of inquiries to refine or redefine elements of the funding and supervision systems, usually with a view to curtailing funding or funding growth, but always with a view to improving standards of care requirements. In my time, I recall making, <coughs> being part of making submissions to Professor Braithwaite's inquiry on how to discipline the industry, ANU Economics Professor and RBA Di Director Bob Gregory's inquiry, uh, professor, economic Professor Warren Hogan and multiple Productivity Commission inquiries. In that period, there were almost as many reviews of nursing care funding mechanisms. We now have a Royal Commission initially linked to the Oakland matter, but fully examining the mainstream of the industry. In my view, the Oakland matter stands quite apart from the rest of aged care. The litany of issues that, uh, that occurred at Oakland from 2008 to its fairly recent to its fairly recent enclosure, if that had arisen in any other facility, that operation would have been drummed out of the industry by the regulators faster than you could say kerosene bath. I personally and many in the industry don't believe 
that the public has any transparent understanding of the multiple and flagrant failures of both the state and federal regulatory systems and their supervisors over an extended period of time. I really do hope the Royal Commission lights a decent fire under policymakers to ensure the system works. And it will take appreciably more resources and is likely to be a combination of substantial, assistant resident fund, substantial additional resident funding and for those assessed as not being able to afford it, a big lift in taxpayer funding. The favourite pastime of blaming people in the system should be replaced by shaming the architects and in some instances the regulators of the aged care system, not much of which appears to have happened in the Oakman case. I could spend some hours discussing the niggly and, some down, and sometimes downright tricky way in which each funding system from the 70s until now has failed both care providers and their residents. At the moment, there are currently credible reports by uh, major accounting firms detailing that 40% of providers are making an EBITDA loss and half of that number are making a cash loss. Many aged care organisations have negative equity, i.e. they are reliant on the next residence in to fund the bonds of the residents going out or by debt. And if it stops working, um, it looks a lot like a government Ponzi scheme, albeit um, government sponsored. Brian, well, just got a couple more things to say. Public listed aged care providers are all trading at a significant discount to uh, their, their stock market, their initial values, and stock market analysts classify their balance sheets as somewhere between marginal and early warning based on their 31st of December 18 results. I recently read one, one report on a provider which valued each place at $50,000, as against the $250,000 or more that a new place actually costs. Now it's based on their financial performance. There is a very clear linkage between care standards and care funding. The weakest organisations management-wise and or financially show up first, and we have yet again come to that point. There are more facilities in South Australia with sanctions, uh, more than more not-for-profit ones than for-profit ones, and this is the first time I can recall that number in many, many years, if ever. In preparing uh, this, I took a few soundings to see how Trevi was travelling today, and my mail is that Trevi was doing fairly well, particularly well led by facility manager Lynn Norwood. So congratulations to Lynn and her staff, because it really is a hard gig running an aged care facility, and probably all the harder reporting to a corporate head office that doesn't live in the community or even in the state. And I'd just like to recognise uh, Alan Woods as the, the longest surviving of the, the Trevi family. He was um, sort of a Trevi before my time, and he's still there. Um, so Alan's now got the, uh, the history, history of Trevi box. And uh, I hope everybody at uh, Trevi uh, continues to do well, and uh, the organisation uh, hopefully will continue to prosper and survive. Uh, thank you. Boy, that was a feast of information. I think, given the time, uh, I'll give the opportunity to any of the staff members to say something. If they, any of the staff members who uh, Jan or Colleen, any, question, Colleen, Colleen. any qu uh, questions or statements? Brief? No? I always did wonder what the staircase was in the, um, where they had the mills. The staircase where they had the mills. Oh, that was the staircase that went to the roof. The staircase that went to the roof um, yeah. to get up onto the widow walk. Yes. <laughs> One night it was top night <laughs> with all the lights. Two of us went up the stairs out of curiosity and all we could see was roof. <laughs> well, we thought we were going to have a good view. If you climbed up onto the roof ridge, um, you, you, you really would have had a very good view because you could see the Torrens from standing on the roof ridge, you could see the Torrens Island power station. And uh, when the three day event was held just over, the, just over the way, sitting on the roof ridge, you got a really good view of the three day event. Yeah. <laughs> we were disappointed. Another, another time we had a, a cow went under the underground from the southern side. Oh, okay. the cow. The cow, yes. Young heifer. But how it got in, well, one of the windows We've got into the light broken road, yeah. and they got it out, yeah. <laughs>
I'll now, now ask Ray to uh, grab that and uh, give the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Craig. Um, wow, that's all I've got to say. It, uh, I know how long it takes to uh, write up a, uh, for a yeah. session here yeah. for our group, and uh, obviously you've spent a couple of hours doing yours. So, <laughs> but it was very interesting. Um, my uh, uh, knowledge of Tribu goes back to probably about 1959. Uh, my, I remember my grandpa saying that uh, they used to go rabbiting up there. They'd come down from Bob's uh, uh, cave, um, Roffage's farm down in the river, and they'd go up the top and get the rabbits from the top around a Tribu area. So, uh, but apart from that, um, thank you very much for tonight. I appreciate that. It's uh, something that I knew about, and, uh, and I'm sure everyone else does. And I think you mentioned about the Widow's Walk. Yep. Um, that was one of the areas that the PNG in the old days used for the cannon when uh, they spotted the ships coming in from the sailing ships coming in with the mail. And that was one of their ways of alerting the uh, people in the town that the, uh, the ship had arrived with the mail. So that's something that post office people would know, and I'm sure uh, Martin would know that. So once again, thank you very much for today. Well done.